In this exciting tutorial, we're going to be building a clone of the Chrome Dino game with JavaScript and an HTML canvas. The original version of the game can be accessed by typing chrome colon slash ash dino into the browser. And this is the version that we'll be creating. This version can be played on a touchscreen or with a keyboard. It'll scale to fit any screen size. The game features a score counter, randomly generated cactuses, our dino can do a low jump and a high jump, and the game continues to speed up over time. This is Coding with Adam, and let's get to the code. If you enjoy my videos, please subscribe, like, and share. For this tutorial, we're going to be using VS Code on the left and Chrome on the right so that we can see our game as we develop it. As you know, this game is developed so that it can play on any screen size and scales itself automatically. So it's going to look a little bit tiny here, but every once in a while, I'll make it bigger so we can more easily see what we're developing. For this project, we're going to have the following images and all of these images come from the sprite sheet. What I've done is cut them out so it's more easier for us to work with. We have various cactus images of different sizes we have two images for the dinosaur running. We have the ground image that you can see along the bottom. And then we have an image for our dinosaur when it's standing still and an optional image with the dinosaur standing still with the eye closed. Check the description for a link to all the images. Once you have the images, copy them into VS Code into an images folder. Let's start by creating our index.html. Inside the index.html, I'm going to put an exclamation and hit tab for the default HTML. We're going to give it a title of Dino Game. Inside the body, we're going to go ahead and add a canvas and we're going to give it an ID of game. Inside of our head tag, we're going to go ahead and add a style tag. And inside that style tag, we're going to add some default styling. We're going to remove all the padding and set that to zero pixels. And we'll also set the margin to zero pixels so that we can see our canvas on the screen. We'll also set a style for our canvas and we'll give it a border of 0.1 pixels solid gray. To run our code, we're going to use a VS Code extension called Live Server. If we click on the Extensions tab, we can go ahead and search for Live Server. Once you find Live Server, click on it and click the Install button. Once it's installed, we can go back to our Explorer, right click on our index.html and say Open with Live Server. You should then see it open up in your Chrome tab and you should see the borders. However, I'm going to make the borders a little bit bigger over here. They are kind of tiny, but look really nice in the end result. So for now, I'll just make them two pixels and we can see the borders for our canvas. Next, we'll go ahead and we'll place our canvas in the center of the screen. So I'm going to add a style on our body. We're going to use display flex. We're going to line the items center and we'll justify the content center. And lastly, we're going to set the height of our screen to 100 VH which is the viewport height. And you'll see that our canvas is centered in the middle of the screen. And since we're using live server, every time that we save in VS Code, it's going to automatically refresh our browser. The following CSS that I'm going to be adding is for touch support. And what it does is basically prevents the user from selecting text or selecting anything when they're touching the screen. This is something you need to do for game development to basically disable all touch actions except for the ones that you want. The touch action that we're going to want is every time you tap the screen, it's going to make the dinosaur jump and we don't want the canvas to be selected. Now, I typically don't copy and paste code into these tutorials, but this is quite a bit of CSS over here and won't affect the game if you're only developing it for desktop. However, if you do want this CSS over here, it will be available in the complete project for you to copy and paste. And that's all the CSS that we need. Let's go ahead and create our index.js file. And then back inside of our index.html, we're going to go ahead and add a script tag. And the script tag will point to our index.js. We're also going to add defer, which means that this script file will load after our HTML loads. And we're also going to add type is equal to module, so we can use ES6 imports. Next, let's go ahead and test that our JavaScript is working correctly. So inside of our index.js we'll just do a console.log of hi and then inside chrome we're going to go ahead and just open up our inspect 
and then we'll go to the console tab and just double check that it says hi. If you're not seeing hi, go back to your index.html and double check that you've created your script tag properly. Inside of our index.js, the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and get a reference to our canvas. We're going to use document.getElementById and we're going to pass in the ID of our canvas, which is game. So you can see over here, we use ID game. And then from our canvas, we're going to go ahead and get our CTX, which is our context. And we're going to get that from our canvas.getContext. And the context, you can kind of think of like a paintbrush. It's the thing that we're going to use to draw to our canvas. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to dynamically size our canvas. We'll start by creating two variables, game width and game height. The game width we're going to set to 800 and the game height we're going to set to 200. The 800 by 200 is the dimensions of this world and will scale to fit any browser size. We'll start by creating a function called set screen. Inside set screen, we're gonna go ahead and calculate our scale ratio. First, we'll create a variable over here and we're gonna call it scale ratio. And then inside a set screen, we're going to go ahead and set the scale ratio based on the result of get scale ratio. Below our set screen method, we're going to go ahead and define the get scale ratio method. The first thing that we'll do inside this method is we're going to figure out the screen height. Now, what I'm going to be doing over here is I'm going to be getting the lowest value between the window and the document height. So I'm going to use window.innerHeight and document.documentElement.client height. So the lower of these two numbers will be the one that I'm using. I noticed a strange phenomenon when I was developing this game and I would jump into developer tools and be using this screen height here or on a mobile device and I would get the incorrect width or height. So I decided that I would always use the min height which was always correct on all the devices that I tested. So we'll go ahead and do the same thing for the screen width. We're going to do a math dot min we'll do a window dot inner width and then we'll do document dot document element dot client width now this will determine our screen width and our screen height based on these two numbers and our game width and game height we're going to figure out if the screen is either really narrow like this or is it widescreen like this where the width is greater than the height in order to do that what we're going to do is we're going to do if our screen width divided by our screen height is less than our game width divided by our game height, then we're going to know that our screen is actually wider. So over here, we'll say window is wider than the game width. Then what we're going to do is we're going to return the screen width divided by our game width. And then inside of our else statement, that's going to mean that our window is taller. And we're just going to return our screen height divided by our game height. Now, if all of this is really confusing, which I gather it probably is, I found it confusing as well. All you really need to know at the moment is that we're going to be scaling this so that it fits on any screen size. The result of get scale ratio is going to be a number that we can use to multiply any of our widths and heights to make it fit on the screen. Let's go ahead and try this out. So we have our canvas over here and we're going to take our width and we're going to say that it's equal to our game width times our scale ratio. And then we're going to take our canvas height and we're going to say that it's equal to our game height times our scale ratio. And then we can go ahead and call this method. So over here, we'll go ahead and call set screen. And when we do that, you're going to see that our window scales to the size of the screen. However, if we go and we change the size of our browser, you'll see that it doesn't change size. If I hit refresh, it does change size to fit the size of the screen. Next, we're going to handle if the browser changes size, we want our canvas to change size as well. The easiest way to do this is to add an event listener for resize on the window. 
And we'll do that over here. And we're going to pass in the set screen method. When we save that and we go ahead and we resize our browser, we're then going to notice that the canvas automatically resizes. As I mentioned, the resize is really simple and works really well on desktops. However, on mobile devices, I did run into a few issues when rotating my screen, either from portrait to landscape or landscape to portrait. Sometimes the canvas would not resize properly and would either be too small or too large. I noticed this issue on both Safari and Chrome and have two different fixes for it. First, let's go ahead and fix the issue on Safari. So I'll add a little comment over here that says we're going to be using set timeout in order to fix this on the Safari browser. So what we're going to do is we're just going to wrap our set screen in a set timeout and we're just going to put a 500 millisecond delay. In the Chrome developer tools, I can click on this button over here, which makes it responsive, but also I can select a mobile device. So I'm using an iPhone. I'm going to click the rotate button and you'll see a bit of a delay and then it expands. And the same thing with portrait and then it shifts itself. So this fixes the issue in Safari. For Chrome and other browsers that support the screen orientation, we can actually check what the screen orientation is. So we'll check for the existence of the screen orientation variable. And if it does exist, then we can add an event listener on screen orientation that checks when the screen orientation changes, which is a lot more accurate than resize. Unfortunately, Safari doesn't support that at the moment. So we can go ahead and add this over here and all other browsers will be supported. And we'll just call set screen. We don't need to use a set timeout or any trick like that. This one's a little bit more straightforward. And this if statement here is just making sure that screen orientation exists because it doesn't exist on some browsers. Next, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to implement the game loop. The game Game loop is the function that's going to be called every single time and will update the screen. There are a few ways we can call the game loop method over and over. We could use set timeout, set interval, and the way that we're going to be doing it is with request animation frame. Request animation frame will call a method when it's ready to repaint the screen. Inside our game loop, we're going to go ahead and just put a console.log of game loop and we're going to save and you'll see that it prints game loop only once. In order to call the method again, at the end of the game loop, we're going to call request animation frame passing in the game loop again. Now when we save it, we're going to see that game loop is being called over and over. The speed at which the request animation frame will be called will be dependent on your monitor's refresh rate and your hardware of your computer. One of the first things that we typically want to do inside of our game loop is clear the screen. Clearing the screen will remove the old drawing so that you can draw your new drawing. We're going to go ahead and add the clear screen function above. We're going to use ctx.fillstyle and we're going to set the color to white. Then we're going to go ahead and call ctx.fill rectangle and we're going to pass in the starting coordinates of 0, 0 from the corner and we're going to fill the entire canvas. So let's use the canvas width and the canvas height. Now when I save it, you're not going to see any changes. So let's go ahead and just change this to a different color. Now you can see it's clearing the screen with the color red. However, we're going to want to use the color white. Since we're making our Dino Jump game work for any screen size, we're also going to make it work for any screen frame rate. So if you have a 60 hertz monitor or a 144 hertz monitor, it'll all run at the same speed. In order to do that, we're going to need to do some calculations. Within our game loop, we're going to get to the frame time between frames, and we can use that calculation to make sure that everything runs at the same speed, regardless of your hardware. When we use the request animation frame, it actually passes an extra variable to our game loop. The extra variable that it's passing is the current time. If we go ahead and print out the current time, we're going to see that that value just continues to go up. We can use the current time to check the time between frames. We're going to create a variable called previous time. And I'm going to go ahead and set that right after our scale ratio. And we're going to default it to null. Back inside our game loop, we're going to go ahead and check if our previous time is equal to null. If it is equal to null, then we're going to go ahead and set our previous time equal to the current time. And then we're going to call request animation frame again, and we're going to exit this version of the game loop over here that doesn't have a previous time. Then the next time we come through, we're going to have a previous time. As a result of that, we're going to be able to calculate the frame time delta. We're going to create a variable 
over here called frame time delta, and we're going to make that equal to the current time minus the previous time. And then we're going to go ahead and set our previous time equal to the current time. Now we can go ahead and print out our frame time delta. And you'll see that it's a fairly consistent number of 16 on my monitor. And depending on your frame rate of your monitor, you may have a different number. But this number is the number that we're going to use later in the game to make sure that everything moves at the same speed, regardless of the hardware that you have. The very next thing that we're going to focus on is displaying our dinosaur on the screen. We're going to refer to our dinosaur as the player. Let's go take a look at our image for our dinosaur. The first image that we're going to show is our dinosaur standing still. The width of this image is 88 and the height is 94. You can see that here down in the corner in VS Code. If we go back to our index.js, we're going to define a couple of constants. First, we're going to define the player width and we're going to make that equal to 88. Then we're going to define the player height and we're going to make that equal to 94. Now, the player is going to exist in our world where the height of the world is 200. If we continue with the height of 94, that's going to make our player almost half the height of the screen. In order to reduce this, we're going to divide it by 1.5. 5 and dividing by 1.5 will make our player's height 62. Now 62 out of 200 seems about perfect for the height of our dinosaur and to make it proportional we're also going to divide the width by 1.5 which will make the width of our player 58. It's important to understand that the numbers that we set over here are in the context of this world over here where the width is 800 and the height is 200 and we want our game objects to fit within that world. Let's Let's define a couple of more constants that our player is going to be using. The next constant that we want to define is the max jump height of our player. The max jump height is going to be equal to the entire height of our game. Then we're also going to define a min jump height. Our dino game, like the original dino game, allows you to jump at different heights. A quick tap of the space bar will give you the min jump height, and pressing the space bar for a little longer will allow you to jump at your max height. In addition to the max jump height, we'll also define a min jump height. And the min jump height we're going to set to 150. The 150 is going to be 150 of our max height, which is 200. Now we can go ahead and define our player class. We'll create a new file called player.js. In this file, we'll export default class of player and we'll go ahead and we'll define our constructor. Our constructor is going to take in the ctx, the width, the height, the min jump height, the max jump height, and the scale ratio. We're going to be using the scale ratio after to position our dinosaur. Then all we have to do is assign all our variables. So ctx is going to be equal to ctx. We're also going to get the canvas. And then the rest of these, we just have to assign. Back inside our index.js, where we're going to define all of our game objects. So we'll just create a little comment here, game objects. We'll do let player is equal to null. Then inside the set screen, we're going to go ahead and call a method that we're going to be creating called create sprites. And this is where we're going to create all of our sprites. We'll define that method above our set screen. We'll call it create sprites. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to figure out the width and the height of our player based on the scale ratio. As you recall, we kind of scaled our image over here to 58 of the game world. However, the game world is scaled based on the browser size. In order to figure that out, what we're going to do is we'll just define a few variables over here. And we're going to say, what is the player's width in game? And what we'll do is we're going to take our player width and we are going to times the scale ratio. I'm just going to duplicate this line over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use our height here. So we'll do the same thing for our height and we'll times the scale ratio. And this is going to give us the player's height and width dependent on the size of our browser. And then we'll do exactly the same thing for our min and max jump. We'll define a constant called min jump height in game. And we're going to make that equal to the min jump height 
times the scale ratio. And then we'll do the same thing for the max jump height in a game. And we'll make that equal to our max constant jump height times the scale ratio. Then we can go ahead and import our player. At the very top of the screen, we're going to go ahead and do an import of player from the player file. Then inside create sprites, we can use that player and we have our player object defined over here and we're going to go ahead and assign it to a new player, passing in the CTX, the player width in game, the player height in game, the min jump height in game, the max jump height in game, and lastly, the scale ratio. Now that we have our player object, we can scroll down to our game loop. After the call to clear screen, we're going to create two sections in our code. One where we update game objects and another section where we draw game objects. We'll start by adding our player.draw. We'll get an error in our console because that method doesn't exist. So we'll jump to our player class and we'll go ahead and add a draw method that will remove the error in our console. Before we implement the draw method, we'll go ahead and implement a couple of items within our constructor. We're going to need to position our player and we're going to use an X and a Y variable to do that. First, we're going to set our X and we're going to set our X so it's 10 away from the edge of the screen. That 10 is going to be different depending on how the screen is scaled. So we're going to times that by the scale ratio. Then we're going to go ahead and set our Y value. We want our dinosaur to be at the bottom of the screen. So we need to get the canvas dot height and then minus the height of our player. And then we are going to minus about 1.5 from the bottom of the screen but once again that number could be different depending on the size of your screen and we times that by the scale ratio the image that we're going to be using is the standing still image within our constructor we're going to go ahead and define a variable to get that image we'll call it standing still image and we're going to make that equal to new image then we'll use the standing still dot image dot src in order to set the path to the image finally to track the image that we're using we're going to be using this dot image as there will be different images for jumping running and standing still we're going to assign the current image to the standing still image. If you type the image name incorrectly, you'll get a 404 error in your console. If you have a 404 error, check the spelling of the image. Inside the draw method, we're going to go ahead and display our current image using ctx.drawImage, which takes in the image, the x position, the y position, and the width and height of our image. And then we can save and we'll have our dinosaur on the screen. Changing the size of the window will also change the size of our dinosaur within the canvas. And you'll notice that our dinosaur is always the right distance from the edge of the canvas, whether it's the left or the bottom position, since we use the scale ratio in our calculation of the position. Now that we have our dinosaur on the screen, the next thing we're going to do is get our ground on the screen and have the ground moving. Let's start by creating a new file called ground js inside this file we're going to go ahead and export a default class of ground we'll define a constructor that takes in the ctx the width the height the speed of the ground and the scale ratio we'll assign those values we'll assign ctx to ctx then we'll grab the canvas from our ctx set the width to width set our height as well and the speed at which the ground will be moving and the scale ratio we're going to default the x position to zero the y position of our ground should be at the bottom of the screen in order to achieve this we're going to take the canvas height and minus the height of the ground 
to position it at the bottom. Lastly, we'll need our ground image. If we take a look at our folder structure over here and we look at our images, we'll see that we have a ground.png. A little bit hard to see on this background, but if I zoom in, you can see that ground image. It's a rather long image being 2400 pixels by 24 height. So go back to our ground over here and we'll go ahead and we'll create a field called ground image and set it to a new image. And then we'll set the src property to point to that image which we'll get from the images directory slash ground.png we'll then jump back to our index.js file at the top of the file we're going to go ahead and import our ground next we'll go ahead and define constants for our ground width and our ground height and we're just going to define them over here with the rest of the height and width objects we'll call this one ground width and we're going to set it to the same size as the image which is 2400 pixels and then we'll also define one for the height which is 24 pixels as for the speed, we're going to define another constant, but this speed is going to be the same speed that we use for the ground and for the cactus. So we're going to create one variable and call it ground and cactus speed and set that to 0.5. We'll define a game object for our ground and we'll set that to null. In our create sprites, we'll create a variable called ground width in game and we're going to make that equal to the constant that we just created for the ground width and we'll times that by the scale ratio we'll duplicate that line and i'll just change that to height and we'll change this to height below our player object we'll go ahead and create our ground object say ground is equal to new ground we're going to pass in the ctx the ground width in game the ground height in game we'll pass in the constant for our ground speed which is ground and cactus speed and finally we'll pass in the scale ratio we'll start by drawing our ground we'll scroll down to the game loop and just above the player.draw we'll add a ground.draw and as soon as we save we're going to get an error because the method doesn't exist we'll hop on over to our ground and we'll create a draw method saving that we'll remove the error in the draw method we're going to go ahead and call ctx.draw image we'll pass in the ground image that we created in the constructor the x position the y position the width and the height once we save that we're going to have the ground on the screen the ground's not moving at this moment but we can see the ground let's go back to index.js and inside of the game loop in the section that we have called update game objects we're going to go ahead and call ground dot update and we're going to pass in two variables one of those variables is going to be the game speed and the other is going to be the frame time delta now we don't have the game speed defined so let's go ahead and create that in the dino game the game speed object gradually increases over time to increase the difficulty of the game we'll scroll up to the top and we're going to define two new constants the first constant that we're going to define is the game speed start which we're going to set to a value of 0.75 for now eventually we'll make that value 1.0 the second variable that we're going to define is our game speed increment value and this is how much we're going to be incrementing our game speed with every single game loop and we're going to set that to 0 0.00001 which will be a tiny increment with every single game loop. Then below where I've defined our scale ratio in previous time, let's go ahead and define our game speed. And we're going to default it to our game speed start, which will be 0.75. Note that we're not using the game speed increment. We'll be doing that towards the end of the video. However, for now, we will just be using a constant value for our game speed. And you'll notice that our game speed not defined error went away. And now we have to implement the update method on our ground object back to the ground file we'll go ahead and we'll create an update method the update method is going to take in the game speed and the frame time delta before we make use of the game speed or even the frame time delta let's go ahead and just get the ground moving as a little test we're going to take our this.x and we're going to change its position we're going to do minus equals and we'll put the value 10 and save that 
and you can see that our ground is moving. Well, let's go ahead and see that on a larger screen. You can see the ground is moving, which makes it look like the dinosaur is moving along our background. However, we do eventually run out of ground. You have to use a little trick to loop the background so that it looks like it goes on forever. Here's a trick that we're going to be using. What we're going to do inside of our draw method is we're going to draw the background twice. So we're going to go ahead and copy our original draw over here and paste it. And then we're going to offset our second draw image by the width of the ground. So we're drawing our first ground and then beside that ground, we'll draw another ground beside it, which is plus the width of the other ground. And let's go ahead and try this out. If we try this out, it's going to take a little bit longer because there are now two ground images being drawn side by side. So you'll notice it takes a little longer, but eventually we will run out of ground again. In order to fix that, we're going to go ahead and check the X position and if it's a certain amount off the screen then we're going to reposition the X position. To do this we're going to go ahead and take our X and we're going to check if it's less than the negative value of this dot width. Then we're going to go ahead and set this dot X equal to zero. When this happens the ground is going to reset creating a continuous loop for our ground. Just a quick note, there's always multiple ways to solve a solution. In this solution, we decided to use a single x variable and just attach the width to it, as you could see on line 32. However, you could use two x variables and track those independently, and I'm sure there are many more ways to solve this. Next, we're going to go ahead and implement our update method. You may have noticed that when the screen is really small, that the background will move fast, and when the screen is large, it'll move really slow. To fix this, we're going to use the game speed, frame time delta, and scale ratio to make sure that all the screens move at the same speed. We'll remove the 10 and replace that with game speed times frame time delta times this dot speed that we pass into the constructor times the scale ratio. Right off the bat, you'll see that the smaller screen has slowed down. However, if we go over here in the comparison, we can see that the smaller screen and the bigger screens are all going at the same rate. What you can see that is if we find one of these hills over here, you can see that each screen, the dinosaur passes the hill at the very same time. Next, we're going to go ahead and animate our dinosaur so that it runs along the ground. We'll jump back into our index.js and inside of our game loop, we're going to go ahead and call player.update. After our ground over here, we'll call player.update and we're going to pass in the game speed and the frame time delta. When we save that, it'll tell us that the method doesn't exist. We'll jump over to our player and implement that method. We'll add the update method with the game speed and the frame time delta as parameters. For this animation, we're going to be using two images. We're going to use Dino Run 1 and Dino Run 2. Inside of our player JS, we're going to go ahead and define a constant that we're going to use for our animation timer. We're going to call this walk animation timer and we'll set the value to 200. Then we're going to create a second variable called walk animation timer that will hold the actual count and we'll default it to the walk animation timer constant and what's going to happen is we're going to take this value and decrement it until it gets to zero and then we'll go ahead and switch between dino 1 and dino 2 image and we'll also define an array called dino run images and we'll just set that to an empty array Inside of our constructor, we'll go ahead and get those images. We'll create a dino run image one variable and we'll set it to a new image. Then we'll go ahead and set the SRC property to images slash dino run one dot PNG. Then we're going to take that and duplicate it. So feel free to copy that or duplicate those lines. And I'll just change this dino image two, and we'll call this two over here. Then I'm going to go ahead and add those images to the array. So we'll take our dino run images and we're going to push on the first dino run image and the second dino run image. When you save that, you shouldn't have any errors. If you do, it's most likely because you have the image name incorrect. If you do, double check that and fix it. Inside of our update method, we're going to go ahead and call a method that we haven't created yet called run. And we're going to pass in the game speed and the frame time delta. Then we'll go ahead and define the run method, passing in the game speed and the frame time delta. 
The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to check if the walk animation timer is less than or equal to zero. That means we're going to be switching between images. And then we're going to keep this really simple. We're just going to check if this dot image is equal to this dot dino run images. And we're going to look into that array and just check if it's equal to the first image. If it is equal to the first image, that means all we have to do is switch our image to the second image in the array. Now we could come up with a more creative solution that would work for any size array. However, we only have two images and why not keep this code simple? And we'll just do the opposite over here. So instead of using dino run images one, like we did here, we're gonna go ahead and just pass in zero. Since we're inside this if statement over here, that means our walk animation timer is zero and we need to reset it back to the default value. So we'll take our walk animation timer and we'll just use our constant that we created. This will reset it back to 200. The very last thing that we need to do is actually decrement our walk animation timer. And the way that we're going to be doing this is we're gonna use our walk animation timer. We'll do a minus equals the frame time delta times the game speed. This will ensure that the dinosaur will move at the same rate, no matter the refresh rate. So if you're playing on a gaming monitor with 240 hertz, or if you're playing on a regular monitor with 60 hertz, the dinosaur will move at the same rate. By saving, we can now see that our dinosaur is running along the ground. And we can even control the ground speed and the dinosaur speed through a single variable. And that's the variable that we're going to be implementing, which is the game speed. Let's go ahead and just change our game speed start to two, and you'll see that our dinosaur moves really fast and the ground also moves really fast. I'll go ahead and change that back to 0.75. Now that we have our dinosaur running, we can go ahead and get our dinosaur to jump when we press the space bar or we touch the screen. Let's do a quick review of the jump functionality. The way the jump is going to work is if you quickly tap the screen or press the space bar, the dinosaur is going to jump at a minimum height, a quick little short jump. As you can see, I'm doing quick little short jump here. But if I want to, I can also hold the space bar or tap the screen a little bit longer and the dinosaur will jump at its full height. Inside of our player.js, we're going to go ahead and set up a few more variables related to the jump. We're going to have a jump pressed that we're going to set to false, a jump in progress that we will set to false, a falling that will also set to false. Then we're going to have a constant, which is going to be our jump speed, and we're going to set that to 0 0.6. So this is when we're going against gravity and going up. And then we're also going to have a gravity for when we're falling and that value is going to be 0 0.4. Now these are numbers that I played with and tried and experimented with and I found that these work the best. But if you change these numbers, you'll get different jump behaviors. For the jump, we're gonna be taking input and we're gonna be taking keyboard input and touch input so we can support mobile devices. Inside of our constructor, we're gonna go ahead and add some event listeners. First, let's add event listeners for our keyboard. For the keyboard, we're going to use window, add event listener, and we're going to add an event listener for key down. And we're going to be calling a method called key down. And we're also going to add one for key up. So I've duplicated that line and we'll do key up and I'll change this to key up as well. Now, whenever we construct our player, we want to make sure that we remove any old event listeners. So before we do the add event listeners, I'm going to duplicate those lines again. And then I'm going to change this over here so that it says remove event listener. And we're going to first remove the event listener for our key down and key up if it exists. And then we'll add those back. Because as you know, in our index.js, whenever we resize the window, we reconstruct those objects, which would add new event listeners. We want to make sure that we remove them. We'll then go ahead and implement the key down and key up events. For key down, we're going to assign that to an arrow function. Very important as we need the correct reference to this. So for the key down, it's going to take in an event over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to check the event code to see if the space bar is being pressed. To do that, we do event.code and then we simply just check that it's equal to space. If it is equal to space, then we're going to say this dot jump pressed is equal to true. And then we can go ahead and just copy our key down, paste it below, rename it to key up. 
And inside the key up, we're just going to do the opposite. If it is space, we're going to set it to false. To test this out, we can go inside of our update method over here. And I'm just going to simply just add a console.log and we'll do a this.jump pressed and print it out. You'll see that it's false. However, if I click in the screen and press the space bar, you'll see that it's true. As soon as I let go of the space bar, it'll go to false. So let's go ahead and implement the touch event next. The touch events will be very similar to our keyboard events. We're going to add a section called touch in our constructor. Then we're going to do window.addEventListener. And we're going to add an event called touch start, all lowercase. Then we'll call a method called touch start all lowercase and then we'll just duplicate that and the second event that we're looking for the equivalent of key up is touch end and we'll create a method called touch end just like our keyboard events we're also going to want to remove these event listeners if they already exist so we'll just duplicate those lines and we'll change the add to remove let's go ahead and implement the touch start method touch start will be an arrow function once again the touch start is a little bit simpler all we have to do is set the jump pressed to true and then we can just copy our touch start and below we're just going to rename it to touch end and we'll set the jump pressed to false to test this out, I'm going to go ahead and put our console.log back. And if I press space, you'll see that it says true, just like it did before. I let go, it says false. But to test the touch, we can click this little toggle over here for different devices. And if I just expand the window, you'll see that I have this drop down. I can pick different phones and whatnot, which will give us different dimensions. But we also have access to touch now. So if I touch the screen, you'll see that it said true. And as soon as I let go, it says false. Now that our keyboard and touch events are working we can focus on the code that will make our dinosaur jump we'll go down to our update method and we're going to call a new method that doesn't exist called jump and we're going to pass in the frame time delta we'll implement that method below taking in the frame time delta the first thing that we're going to do inside of our jump is we're going to be checking if the jumped key is being pressed if jump is being pressed, this means that there is a jump in progress and we're going to set jump in progress to true. Even though you let go of the jump button, we want to make sure your dinosaur at least jumps to the minimum height. The next thing we're going to do inside the jump is we're going to check if the jump is in progress and our dinosaur is not falling. That's going to mean that we are most likely in the progress of jumping upwards. If we are, we have to check a few things. We have to check our dinosaur's Y position and see if it's greater than this.canvas.height minus this dot min jump height. So as long as our Y is greater than the minimum jump height, that means we have to continue increasing. So if our dinosaur just jumps a little, we don't want him to fall right away. You want to go until we get to the min height. That's what this part of the if statement is going to do. The other condition that can make us continue to jump, and we'll do that inside of an or, is we're going to check if this dot Y is greater than this dot canvas dot height to minus the max jump height and we're going to check that you're still pressing the jump button on the keyboard as you recall the min jump height and the max jump height are passed into our constructor and then those values come from our index.js where we establish that our max jump height is going to be the top of the screen while the min jump height is going to be 150 of our 200 height if this condition is true, then we're going to go ahead and increase our Y position. Technically, it's decrease our Y position because zero is up here, higher numbers up here. So we'll do a minus equals and we're going to take the jump speed times the frame time delta times the scale ratio. And this will make sure that we jump at the same rate regardless of the screen size or the frame rate that you have. If none of these conditions are true over here, then we're going to go ahead and do an else statement. And that else statement is going to say that falling is equal to true. Now I understand this can be a little bit hard to read. So we have this outer if statement over here that checks if a jump is in progress and we're currently not falling. Then we have this if statement over here that checks are we at least jumping to the height of our min height. And then the second part of this is are we continuing to jump until 
until we hit the max height if we're still pressing the spacebar or touching the screen. If we are, then our Y will continue to decrease, which will make us go up. Otherwise, we're going to be falling. When we're falling, we need to know how far our dinosaur can fall. In order to do that, we're going to go ahead and create a new variable in our constructor that's going to match the Y variable that we initially set. This Y variable is going to be called y standing position so this is our initial y standing position and we're going to make that equal to y as y will constantly be changing we want this to be static and this will be this position over here then back inside of our jump method we'll be doing an else statement for this if statement so if we collapse this over here, it's a little bit easier to see where that else statement is going to be. And inside of that else statement, we're going to do a couple of checks. The first check we're going to do is we're going to check if our y is less than this dot y standing position. If it is less than this position, that means we are still falling. And if we are falling, we need to increase our y. So we do plus equals and we use our gravity times the frame time delta times this dot scale ratio to ensure that we fall at the same rate for any screen refresh rate or any screen size. And then we'll do one more check inside this if statement over here. So within this if statement over here, we're going to check that the dinosaur can't actually fall through the ground. If the dinosaur is going through the ground, then we're going to go ahead and reposition the dinosaur back to its original standing position. The way we do this is we check our this.y plus this.height is greater than this.canvas dot height and if it is then we go ahead and say that our y is equal to the y standing position which will reposition the dinosaur back to its original position and then lastly outside of this if statement over here if i collapse it down you'll see that we're going to have another else and this else over here is simply just going to go ahead and set the falling to a false when we're done falling and it'll also set the jump in progress to false as as well. Let's go ahead and test this out. If I quickly press the space bar, you'll see that I'll just do a short jump with the min jump height. And if I hold it, I'm going to go ahead and hit the top of the ceiling of our game. Opening our dev tools and going into mobile mode, I can simulate touch events with my mouse. A quick little tap will make the dinosaur jump at its min height. If I go ahead and hold the mouse down a little bit longer, We'll simulate a longer jump where we can jump and hit our head against the ceiling of the game. One thing you may have noticed is when we jump, our feet are still moving. In the original game, the dinosaur stays still. So let's go ahead and make that change. Inside of our update method, after the run method, we're going to go ahead and add an if statement. And all we're going to do is we're going to check if a jump is in progress. If a jump is in progress, we're going to go ahead and change the image to be the standing still image that we defined earlier when our dinosaur was standing still at the beginning of the game. We'll go ahead and save that. We'll try that out. And when we jump, you'll see that our feet stay still. The next thing we're going to focus on is randomly generating cactuses for our dinosaur to jump over. In our images folder, we're going to find three types of cactuses, a single cactus that is large, two double cactuses, and a third cactus that is two smaller ones. We're going to code this dynamically so that you can add additional cactuses in the future of varying shapes and sizes. Inside of our index.js, we're going to go ahead and define a variable called cacti config. As you can see, it's a constant and it's going to be an array of objects. Cacti is the plural form of cactus. You can also call it cactuses if you wanted to. I'm going to call it cacti and we're going to have multiple objects inside here. For each object, we're going to have a width and that's going to come from our image. So this image is 48 by 100. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply our 48 over here. And just like we did with our player, we're going to divide that by 1.5 to make that image a little bit smaller and match our player size and for the height as we saw it was 100 and we'll also divide that by 1.5 and then all we need is the image over here and it's just going to be the path to the image so that's images cactus underscore one dot png then we're going to go ahead and duplicate that line as we have three different cacti however they are different sizes the second image if we take a look at it is 98 by 100 
So we can go over here and change this value to 98, leave that as 100, but we'll change the path to the image to say two. And then for the third image, we can also change that path to be three. However, it is a different size. So we jump back over here. It's 68 by 70. So we change this number to 68 and the height to 70. Before we use our cacti config, let's go ahead and create a brand new file called cacti controller. The cacti controller will be responsible for creating the cacti on the screen. We'll export a default class of cacti controller and we'll create a constructor. The constructor is going to take in the CTX, the cacti images, the scale ratio, and the speed. We'll go ahead and set our CTX value. We'll get the canvas from the CTX and we're just going to set the rest of the variables over here. We'll go back to our index.js and import our cacti controller. Down where we define our game objects, we'll define a cacti controller and set it to null. We'll then scroll down to our create sprites. Inside create sprites, we're going to take our cacti config and transform it into a new list. Call this cacti images. And we're going to make that equal to our cacti config. And we're going to call the map property and each item is going to be a cactus and we'll use an arrow function. Now what we want to do here is we want to first take that string image and transform that into an actual image. The way we'll do that is we'll create a new variable over here called image. We'll make it equal to a new image and we'll use image.src and make that equal to our cactus.image. Then we're going to go ahead and return an object and that object is going to return the image. We're also going to take the width and transform it. So from our cactus config, we grab the width of one of those cacti and then we times it by the scale ratio, just like we did for our player and our ground widths and heights. And then we do exactly the same thing for the height over here. So just rename this to height, rename this to height, and this will give us a list of cacti images, which include the width, the height, and the actual image. And then all we have to do is initialize our cacti controller by calling a new cacti controller and passing in the CTX, the cacti images that we just created, the scale ratio, and the ground and cacti speed. If you have any errors or any 404s over here, it's most likely because one of the images is named incorrectly. If you have the right name, the 404 error will go away. Then we can scroll down to our game loop and we're going to go ahead and call update. We're going to put that between the ground and player. We'll call cacti controller dot update. We'll pass in the game speed and the frame time delta. We'll also call cacti controller dot draw and we'll do that between the ground and the player. Let's jump to our cacti controller to stub out those two methods to remove the errors. We're going to go ahead and add the update method, which takes in the game speed and the frame time delta. And we'll also add the draw method. We'll hit save and the errors will go away. We'll start by creating a couple of constants at the top of the screen. We're going to need a cactus interval min and max. This is the amount of time between which cactuses will be created and we'll be selecting a random number between the min and max. Once we've selected that number, we're going to have to store it somewhere and we'll store it in the next cactus interval and we'll set that to null. And since we're going to have a multiple cactus, we're going to store that in an array called cacti. When we construct our cacti controller, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and call a method called set next cactus time. And we'll define that method below and it's going to be in charge of setting this value over here. The way that the set next cactus time function is going to work is it's going to generate a random number between our cactus interval min and cactus interval max. We'll do that by calling a function that we're going to create called get random number. Get random random number is going to take in the min value and the max value and we'll get a random number between these two values. We can then go ahead and assign the next cactus interval to the random number that we got back. 
Then we can go ahead and implement our get random number function, which will take in a min and a max. It's going to return the value. It's going to go ahead and round down the value that it's going to calculate within here using the random function where we go times the max minus the min plus one plus the min and don't worry if you don't understand this code if you google how to get a random number between min and max you'll find this solution explained on how to get a min and max value what's important is that you know we're getting a random number between our min and max value for our cactus interval let's go ahead and implement our update method the first thing we're going to do inside the update method is we're going to check if the next cactus interval is less than or equal to zero. If it is, that means we're going to be creating a cactus. That also means that we're going to have to go ahead and reset our timer. To reset our timer, we'll call set next cactus time. And if it's not less than or equal to zero, we're going to go ahead and decrement our next cactus interval. The way we're going to do that is just minus equal our frame time delta. To see this in action, let's go into our set next cactus time and we're just going to do a console.log, which will show us the interval that we've set. So we see 867, 751, and these are all the different intervals that are being set for when cactuses will be created. Let's go ahead and call a method over here called create cactus, and then we'll just implement that method above. As you recall, we have several images for our cacti. In our game over here, we have three different images that we're going to be using. So that means there'll be three items inside of our array. And we're randomly going to get one of those cactuses to use. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to use that get random number function that we created. And it's going to be a value between zero and the this.cactiimages.length minus one. So from our array minus one, we're going to get a value and that's going to be the index of the image we're going to be using. We'll get our cactus image equal to this dot cacti images. And from that array, access it using the random index that we just got. Then we're going to go ahead and create an X position for our cactus. And we're going to draw it off screen so that it's further to the right. And then we're going to do that. We're just going to use the canvas dot width times 1.5. This will cause our cactuses to be drawn way off screen before they finally appear on the screen. Then we'll go ahead and create a property for the Y position. The Y position is going to be this dot canvas dot height minus our cactus image dot height. To represent our cactus, we're going to be creating a new cactus class, but let's go ahead and stub out how this class would look. We'll start by creating a const of cactus, and we're going to call new cactus, which we haven't created yet. We'll pass in this.ctx, the x position, the y position, the cactus image dot width, the cactus image dot height, and the cactus image dot image. Since our cactus doesn't exist, we're going to get an error. We're going to go ahead and create a file called cactus.js. We'll export default class of cactus, and we'll create a constructor passing in the ctx, the x, the y, the width, the height, and the image. Then we'll go ahead and we'll assign the variables. Then we'll jump back to our cacti controller. Inside our cacti controller, we're going to go ahead and import our cactus. Our code will be working once again. We can go back to create cactus and we'll take our cactus and add it to the cacti array. To make sure that our create cacti is working, we go into our update method and we can do a console.log and we can print the cacti.length. When we save that, we're going to see that it's zero, but slowly that array is going to be filled with cacti. Next, we're going to go ahead and update all our cacti anytime the update method is called for the cacti controller. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to go ahead and just loop over all the cacti using the for each array method, which takes in an arrow function we're going to take in the cactus and then for each cactus we're going to go ahead and just call cactus dot update passing in this dot speed game speed 
the frame time delta, and the scale ratio. Then we're going to get an error letting us know that we haven't implemented the update method on the cactus. So we'll jump back to our cactus over here and we'll create that method called update. We'll take in the speed, the game speed, the frame time delta, and the scale ratio. Then all we're simply going to do is take the x and minus equals the speed times the game speed times the frame time delta times the scale ratio. Then we'll jump back to our cacti controller. Inside the draw method, we'll go ahead and call this.cacti.foreach. And for each cactus, we're going to go ahead and tell it to draw. Back inside the cactus, we're going to go ahead and create a method called draw. Draw is simply going to call this.ctx.drawImage, passing in this.image, this.x, the y position, the width, and the height. Once we save, we'll see that cactuses are being randomly generated. We can practice jumping over them. However, we do have a couple of issues. One is that cactuses are being endlessly generated, and once they go off the screen, they are still being drawn. And two, we need collision detection. Let's deal with the first problem. Inside our update method, I've added a console log of cacti length. You can see as cactuses go off screen, the length of our cacti continues to go up. So we need to go ahead and remove those cacti that no longer need to be drawn because they've gone off screen. To fix this, inside of our update method, after we do our updates, we're going to go ahead and filter out any cactuses that are off screen, which takes in an arrow function and we'll pass in the cactus as a parameter. And we're going to go ahead and check the cactus.x is greater than the negative value of the cactus.width. Once we save and a few cacti are generated, we're going to see that that array length will stay pretty steady. You'll see it goes up and then back down because we're filtering out those that are off screen. Next, we're going to go ahead and handle our collision. In order to handle our collision, we're going to have to handle a game over. So we'll jump to our index.js and we're going to go ahead and create a brand new variable. We're going to call that variable game over and we're going to set game over to false. Then we're going to scroll down to our game loop and inside of our game loop we're going to use that game over variable to decide whether or not we're updating our game. So we'll go ahead and wrap our update over here with the game over variable and if it's not game over we'll continue to update and we'll place that around all the update methods. Then we're going to go ahead and add another if statement. We're also going to check if it's not game over as we do above. And we're going to check if any of our cacti are colliding with our player by asking the cacti controller if it is colliding with our player. And if it is, then we're going to go ahead and set game over to true. We're then going to go ahead and implement the collide with method on the cacti controller and it's going to take in a sprite. The sprite is just a more general term for our player and it's going to return true or false if there's a collision. We're going to use an array method called sum and it's going to let us know if there's at least one cactus that is colliding and it's going to do it through an arrow function. We're going to ask each cactus if it is also colliding with the sprite. If at least one of the cactuses are colliding with the sprite, we're going to get true returned. The actual collision detection is going to be implemented on our cactus. We're going to go ahead and add the collide with method that takes in a sprite. And the type of collision detection that we're going to be using is called access aligned bounding box. This is the MDN web documentation on 2D collision detection. And what we're going to do is a variation of this where the two boxes are overlapping with each other. We're not going to consider it a collision until you're a little bit overlapped. And the reason for this is because of the images that we have. They have this white border around it and we want the collision to be where the two images are kind of on top of each other. So let's go ahead and do that inside of our cactus. I'm going to create a little variable called adjust by and this is how much we're going to adjust our collision by. I'm going to set this number to 1.4. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and paste the code in and explain it. The code that we're using over here is extremely 
extremely similar to the code that's over here. Now this code over here says that there's going to be a collision as soon as the two objects touch. If you notice this one's blue, this one's red, and as soon as they touch it turns green which means there's a collision. We want our collision to happen when the two objects overlap each other a little bit. Therefore we added the adjust by object which reduces the widths and heights of the objects until they overlap. When there is an overlap and they are colliding, we're going to go ahead and return true. When there isn't, it's going to go ahead and return false. Let's go ahead and try this out. As soon as our dinosaur collides into a cactus, we're going to return true. When that happens inside of our game loop, we go ahead and set game over to true. When game over is true, that means we're no longer going to be updating our game objects. So the ground, the cactuses, it won't be moving, our dinosaur won't be animating, and it is game over. We can go ahead and try this out with a jump. So let's say we're mid-jump and we land inside the cactuses. That is game over as well. And I'm just going to show you a quick little thing over here. If we go back to our cactus and we go ahead and adjust that to 1, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about with the collision. When we collide now, it doesn't actually look like we're colliding. And that's why we use this little adjustment of 1.4. Next, we're going to go ahead and show a game over text inside of our index.js inside of our game loop. After our draw methods, we're going to go ahead and check if it is game over. If it is game over, we're going to go ahead and call a method called show game over. We'll go ahead and create the show game over function. I'm just going to scroll up and put it above my game loop above the clear screen as well. Doesn't really matter where you put it. So we'll call it show game over and inside show game over. I'm going to paste in the following code over here and I'll explain how it works. Essentially, we're just drawing some text to the screen. As you can see right here already on the right hand side, it says game over. We're creating a font size. We are once again using that scale ratio so this will fit on any size screen so if we do get a game over on the bigger screen it's going to look correct just like it does on the smaller screen and essentially we set the ctx dot font to the font size and the font that we want to use we set the color to gray and then we go ahead and position the x and y position to try and center game over on the screen and then lastly we just call ctx dot fill text give it the text we want and the x and y position the next thing we're going to do is when there is a game over we want you to be able to press the space bar or tap on the screen to restart the game back inside the game loop when there is a collision we're going to go ahead and call a method which is going to set up the game reset right after our game over equals true we're going to go ahead and call setup game reset I'll go ahead and define this function below our show game over. The first thing that we want to do in this function is we're actually going to check a bool variable that we haven't created yet called has added event listeners for restart. If we haven't done that, then we're going to go ahead and set the has added event listeners for restart to true. We'll go ahead and copy this variable over here and we'll define our new variable over here and default it to false. Then we're going to go back to our setup game reset and inside of this method over here inside the if statement, we're going to go ahead and simply add some event listeners and we're going to listen for key up. If there is a key up event, we're going to call the reset method, which is going to reset the game. And we only want this to happen once. So we're going to use an option that just says once and call true. Now I'm going to duplicate this and we're going to do exactly the same code for touch start. One extra thing that we can do when these event listeners are added is we can add a bit of a delay so that when game over shows up and you're continuously tapping the screen or pressing space, you may miss the game over screen and automatically restart the game right away. So we may want a little delay. Now this part's optional. You can just leave the code that we have over here or you can add this set timeout if you like. And for the set timeout, we're basically going to take an arrow function in and then I'm going to copy and paste 
paste these lines in over here. So we're going to say that when the timeout completes after a certain amount of time, you could say one second or 500 milliseconds, whatever you like here, then it will only add these events. So you see a delay and then we get the error message letting us know that the reset method doesn't exist. Let's go ahead and implement the reset function. Inside our reset function, we're going to go ahead and call has added event listeners for restart and set that to false. Then we're going to set the game over to false. And the next thing we need to do is tell all of our game objects to reset. So we'll tell our ground to reset and there isn't a method for this. We're going to have to go ahead and add a reset on our ground, on our cacti controller as well. We'll have to go ahead and add that method. And there's no need to add one on our player as there is nothing to reset. And we'll also reset our game speed. We haven't made our game speed increase yet but we might as well do this for the future when we implement this at the end and we'll just say our game speed is equal to our game speed start now if we go ahead and tap any key over here we're going to get an error so let's go ahead and implement reset on our ground and on our cacti controller We'll go ahead and jump into our ground class. Inside the ground, we're going to go ahead and add that reset method. Inside the reset method, the only thing we're going to go ahead and do is set the X to 0. Inside of our cacti controller, we'll also go ahead and add a reset method. And the only thing we're going to do over here is we're going to reset our cacti array back to an empty array. Let's go ahead and try this out. I'm going to collide into a cactus. We get game over. I press space. The game restarts. If I mash the space a few times, it doesn't restart right away. But if I press it now, it will restart because there is that one second delay before it allows me to restart. And I can do this over and over and the game is resetting. Next, we're going to go ahead and implement our waiting to start. Our waiting to start is the text that shows up and says tap screen or press space to start. Inside of our index.js, we're going to go ahead and add a brand new variable. That new variable is going to be called waiting to start. And we're going to default the value to true. Then we're going to scroll down to our game loop. And inside of our game loop, where we update our game objects, we're also going to check that it's not waiting to start. Now you'll notice that our dinosaur isn't moving and the ground isn't moving because we aren't doing any updates. Then at the bottom of the game loop, just like we do for our game over, we're going to check if it's waiting to start. And if it is waiting to start, we're going to go ahead and call a new method that we haven't created yet called show start game text. We'll go ahead and implement that method. I'm going to implement it just below our reset. But once again, it doesn't matter where you put this method. Inside of this method, I'm just going to go ahead and paste in the text that we're going to be showing to make this a little bit quicker. Feel free to copy this. However, we're doing exactly the same thing. We are using that scale ratio to make sure that it looks good on small screens and on large screens. And once again, we set that font, set that fill style to gray position it with the X and Y. And once again, I played around out these numbers until I could kind of get it centered on the screen. And then all we do is use the fill text to pass in the text and position it using the X and Y. As the instructions for our game say over here, tap screen or press space to start, we need to add some event listeners. If we go to our setup game reset, we can copy those event listeners that we had there and then scroll to the very bottom of our index.js and we'll go ahead and add these event listeners. Now if I save this and press space, nothing's going to happen. The reason that nothing's happening is we need to go into our reset method and inside our reset method, we need to go ahead and add the waiting to start and set the value to false. Now when we save it and we press space over here, our game will start. We can even try that with mobile. We'll switch into a mobile mode. We'll refresh the screen. Now when I tap or push my mouse on the screen over here, the game will start. Next, we're going to go ahead and implement the game speed increasing as we play the game. 
If we go to our game loop inside of our index.js, inside of the update game objects section, we're going to go ahead and call a new method that we haven't created yet called update game speed, and we're going to pass in the frame time delta. Then we'll go ahead and just scroll up over here. We'll create the new function called update game speed taking in the frame time delta. All we need to do is take our game speed variable plus equals the frame time delta times our game speed increment. Let's go into our game loop and print out our game speed. You'll see that it's 0.75 right now. I'm going to go ahead and change that number to 1. We mentioned that eventually that number would become 1. Now, in our bigger screen over here, you can see that our speed right now is 1. As soon as we start playing, you're going to see the speed is incrementing. And as we go further in the game, the game is going to get faster. It's not going to get too much faster. It's a gradual increase. So feel free to play with that number and make it increase as fast as you want it to increase. However, when it is game over, you can see it still says the same speed, but when we restart, it restarted back at one. Next, we're gonna go ahead and implement the score that shows in the top right. We'll start by creating the score.js file. We'll export a default class of score and we'll create our constructor passing in the CTX and the scale ratio. We'll assign the CTX to CTX and we'll grab the canvas as well from our CTX.canvas and we'll set the scale ratio equal to scale ratio. We'll also go ahead and create a score variable that we'll define as at the top and set it to zero. And we're also going to create a constant that we're going to be using later called high score key that we're going to use for local storage to store the high score. We'll then go ahead and implement the update method since it's pretty simple. It takes in the frame time delta. Then we're going to assign the score to plus equals of the frame time delta times 0.01. We'll also implement the reset method, which will set the score back to zero. As I mentioned, we're going to have a way to store the high score. The high score is just going to be stored locally on whatever device you're playing the game. And we're going to use local storage to do that. We're going to go ahead and create a method called set high score and the set high score method is going to go ahead and check what the high score is inside of local storage first so we're going to access local storage and whatever value we get back we're going to convert back to a number as it comes back as a string we'll call local storage get item and we're going to be using that key that we defined up above we're going to be using the key multiple times and we don't want to make a mistake spelling it so we store it as a variable then we're going to check if the current score is greater than the high score and if it is greater than the high score then we're going to go ahead and store that in local storage we do that by calling set item on local storage we give it the key and then we give it the value the value that we're going to store could be a decimal number so we're going to call math.floor and then we're going to give it the score value Lastly, we're going to go ahead and implement the draw method. We're going to be drawing the current score in the game and the high score. We'll create a draw method. We'll retrieve the high score from local storage once again. The Y position for the high score and for the current score is going to be exactly the same. And we're going to set that Y position to 20 times the scale ratio to make sure it's in the same place on all screen sizes. Then we're going to go ahead and set the font size to 20 times the scale ratio. We'll also set the font to serif and we'll set the fill style to this almost black color. For the score position, we're going to be setting the X so it's fairly close to the edge. And the way we're going to do that is we're just going to take the canvas minus 75 times the scale ratio. So we take the canvas, it starts on this edge, and then we draw 75 back times that scale ratio. And then we're going to draw the high score position based off of the score X position. So we'll use score X minus 125 times the scale ratio 
ratio. Now you may have noticed that the numbers when the game start over here have padding. There are zeros that start in front. And in order to do that, you can use a JavaScript method called pad start. So for example, let's go ahead and get our score value. Over here, we're getting our score and we're going to round that number down because we're not going to have any fraction numbers over here. We're changing it to a string and then we're using the string method to add some padding. So if there aren't six numbers, it'll go ahead and add additional zeros to pad this and fill that string. And then we'll do exactly the same thing for our high score. We're going to take that high score and then go ahead and pad it if it needs padding or converting it to a two string. We're not doing the math.floor since we store our value already rounded down. And finally, we just need to go ahead and draw our score and our high score to the screen. Now, saving this won't do anything yet as we haven't used our score.js inside of our index.js. Inside of index.js, we're going to go ahead and import our score from the score file. We'll scroll down to our game objects section, define a score variable, and set it to null. Inside of our create sprites at the very bottom, we're going to go ahead and assign our score to a new score, passing in the CTX and the scale ratio. Inside of the reset method, we're going to go ahead and call score dot reset inside of the game loop we're going to go ahead and call score dot update passing in the frame time delta when we do have a game over we're going to go ahead and call score set high score and lastly we're going to go ahead and draw our score we can now see the score displayed in the top right corner. Let's go ahead and start the game. We see that score counter going up. And if we go into a cactus, we see that it's game over. And we also see that our high score was set to 37. Let's go ahead and see if we can improve on that high score. Jump over that cactus, jump over that cactus. And let's get a game over. And we can see that we have a new high score of 62. There you go, we have a clone of the dino game. From here we can add functionality to have our dino duck, add new enemies like birds, add clouds to create a parallax background effect, and much more. Your only limitation is your imagination. If you enjoyed this tutorial, smash the like button, subscribe, and hit that notification bell.